I'm Paul Kegabon with the Garland County Library, and I'm here with the one and only Judy Dare, <laughs> the chairman of the Know It to Grow It, um, part of the Garland County Master Gardeners, and we're here for our latest episode in the Know It to Grow It series, which is the ABCs of Planting for Pollinators. And as always, it's going to be a wonderful program. I've seen a little yeah. sneak peek of a very well-made video that you're going to see a bit of as well as hear from the uh, two ladies who made that program uh, made that video that judy will introduce here shortly but uh first i think we have a little bit of housekeeping business as always so mm -hmm. what do we start with judy all right well i'll 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 take it away paul and be right back with you so i'm so glad y'all are with us tonight we really do have a special program and i'm so proud of the people who put it together um, I'd like to congratulate Paul, first of all, on being recognized as a millennial making a difference. And I'll tell you, he really does. We are so fortunate to have such an awesome library that has a talented staff and they're so creative. There is so much to do at the library between Paul's adult programming, the children's activities and everything in between. So if you are looking for something to do, just check out the library's Facebook page because there is something for everyone. And I'm so proud of Paul for being recognized for what he does. Now I'm wearing pink tonight to highlight Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I've had the honor of working with breast care individuals, radiologists, technologists for several years and want to thank them for their service and their dedication and their caring. For those of you going through treatment, I wish you a quick recovery. This disease does not pick favorites and can affect men as well as women. Early detection is the key, so please stay aware. Now, the Garland County Master Gardeners are accepting applications for new Master Gardener training that will start next January, January the 26th. Thanks to our extension agent, Luke Duffel, we have an easy way to access the application. Now, Paul is going to show a QR code and you can stay, pardon me, scan that code now or pick up a brochure at the library or the extension code, which will have extension office, which will have the code. You can fill out the electronic version of the application and not have to mess with printing and delivering it. The extension agency is at 236 Woodbine is open eight to five Monday through Friday. New Master Gardener meet and greets will start in November. Now this is where applicants will meet with Luke and some Master Gardeners to find out where your interests lie and pair you with a mentor. The Master Gardener program is so much more than just gardening and it really has enriched my life. So please think about joining us. The library is giving away our door prize again tonight and it's another good one. It's a gift certificate to Lake Hamilton Garden Center. It's a great place to plant shop, and we really appreciate the library donating this prize. At the end of the program, Paul will announce the winner, and the prize can be picked up at the library circulation desk. Now, to be entered in the drawing for the prize, you have to give us a question or put something in the chat box so that we know you have joined us. So at the end of the program, Paul will pick the winner. Next month's program will be tablescapes for the holidays and we have more master gardeners that will be showing us how to decorate your Thanksgiving and Christmas tables using supplies from Mother Nature. It really will be a great program again so please join us on the third Wednesday of the month November 16th for the fun. Tonight's program is the ABCs of planting for pollinators with Garland County Master Gardeners, Ann Hires, and Mary Wittenberg. I am so proud to be associated with Master Gardeners like Mary and Ann, who work so diligently on the Youth Activities Committee and share their knowledge and love of planning with school kids in our area. Ann has lived in years. They have two grown children. Ann taught school for 28 years, most of them in kindergarten. She became a Master Gardener in 2016 and was named Rookie of the Year that year. Ann started the Lakeside School Planting Program, and until the pandemic hit, worked with Lakeside's after-school program. Mary has lived in Hot Springs with her husband, Mike, for 25 years and has two sons, Duke and Mason. She is a retired psychologist. She joined the Master Gardener Program in 2018 and was named Master Gardener of the Year in 2020. 
Mary worked for, with the Park Magnet School before she became a master gardener and helped them build an outdoor classroom which focused on a seed to table program for the students. Now master gardeners know a good thing when they see it and they encourage Mary to join the group. The youth committee currently works with five schools. The program started as with vegetable planting but shifted to planting for pollinators a couple years ago to, do con to concerns over our banishing pollinators, and we've talked about that a lot, and sustainability for our food crops. So it is now my pleasure to introduce my Master Gardener friends who will share an outstanding video they made with you and then take questions. Hi. Hey. Hello. So we're glad to have you with us, and we're just going to get that video started, and then at the end of the program, we're going to have question and answer period and show some resources that you all have put together for us. Of course, I've always enjoyed seeing butterflies flutter across my path or yard. Then my encounter with Diana Fritillary on the driveway. And I wondered, why here? Why now? So I told a friend, an active Florida butterfly group friend, and she said, do you have violets in your yard? The answer is yes. We've been fighting them for years. Then stop fighting them, she said. They are the reason for the Diana Fritillary, the host plant that gives this beautiful butterfly a reason to return to my yard year after year. So I did some reading, a lot of observing, and now I believe attracting butterflies is as simple as planting a few things they need. Recently, I was working with a couple of high school girls on an outdoor project and one asked me, is it really that easy to attract butterflies? Well, I now believe it is. Plant them and they will come. If you have nectar plants, trees, shrubs, or flowers, you are already being visited for nectar. If you dig deeper and have host plants or a host tree, you are well on your way for a butterfly habitat. I had a host plant in my yard and was unaware until I really started paying attention. You may already be a butterfly host, too. With nectar plants, host plants, sun and water, you will be providing a place for Diana Fridlary and others to lay eggs and food for the caterpillars. Butterflies use smell and sight to find nectar and host plants. They are influenced by the nutritional needs of their offspring. They see bright colors with their complex multi-directional eyes. They can smell a pollinator plant for miles after all, they smell with six legs and two antenna. Then, when they land with their feet, they'll help sense where their food is and if it is nutritious. Nerve cells all over their bodies receive chemical cues that help direct them to food and a place to lay their eggs. An important fact is that most butterflies and moths have several host plants but the large, beautiful monarch's only host is milkweed. So milkweed is a must if you want to be visited by monarchs. If you only have room for a pollinator container, then go for it with bright colors and lots of blooms. If you need raised beds to improve soil and drainage, then that's the way to go. We will show you a freeform garden, several raised bed gardens, and a couple of butterfly gardens that we've already planted for existing spaces. Our hope is to inspire you to the fascinating world of butterfly watching. In planting for butterflies, we also help many other pollinators. We've put the plant names on some of the pictures for you. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a plant list for, for you from the gardens we will be showing you. Also, we will have a list of resources and a question and answer time. This picture here is, shows the planter boxes at Park Magnet School. They contain carrots, dill, and fennel. 
These plants are black swallowtail host plants. The next bed closer to us shows the passion vine, which is a nectar and a host plant for the Gulf Larry. If you have a favorite butterfly that you would like to attract, look it up, see if it lives in our area, read about its host. When planting, try to extend the time that you will have blooms so early and late season visitors will have food. I've had bees on winter honeysuckle all the way until January. Native plants have evolved together with native species in our area so you are spending wisely and helping the best way with native plants. The research shows how many more species visit native plants as opposed to imports and lawn grasses. Native grasses like the little blue stem, the grama grasses and sea oats are host plants to a whole group of delightful skippers, butterflies. Dead leaves on the ground our host sites for some also beautiful hair streaks. So please leave the leaves. Wild clover are great early bloomers for pollinators and having them in your yard can increase pollination in your vegetable garden. Have you ever had an odd cucumber? This is due to incomplete pollination. You can mow around these early flowers until other things come into bloom. Mary, my remarkable friend, planned, built, and maintained our committee's prize garden many years before she became a master gardener, before we came to help her. She led in transforming a former flood zone into a beautiful, much-used outdoor classroom, rain garden, and butterfly area at Park Magnet School. We like the shape of this garden. It's loosely a kidney bean shape. It's natural looking. It lends itself to lots of colors and plant varieties. It's much fun to maintain dividing and multiplying species that we share with our other sites. This garden has a sweet spire hedge around one end, tall bee bombs, black and blue sage, pineapple sage, yarrow, and a large ironweed, somewhat rare, that we have greatly enjoyed spreading around. It also has woodland aster and not showing is lamb's ear and green-eyed flower. Here is our committee decorating the garden that's seen from the lunchroom hall during COVID. This is a picture of the park rain garden area before the rain garden was built. It was initially knee deep in mud and water. This picture is a drawing that was made by the stormwater commission of a hot springs of uh, city hall of a proposed garden. And this was the initial garden that was built. This is the garden after six years in existence. This is a weather station that we built for the outdoor classroom. This bridge was built so water could and behind the bridge is a pergola with Adirondack chairs so that students could read outside. So, butterfly areas can be freeform like the park school garden. Another freeform garden that is quite lovely is the Xeriscape Hot Springs. This garden is over by the Greenway, just south of the new majestic ball fields. Go take a look. It's got a very interesting shape, lovely plants, and best of all, a devoted group that cares for it. Or you might build a rectangular garden like the next few examples. Main Street School Garden has an established garden and master gardeners have been involved in this garden since 2010 when Sue Finley and Barbara Smith began working there. This garden is a large rectangle on one side and on the other side there's a wide sidewalk and a square. 
Many days, both doors on the ends of the gardens are open, and students and teachers pass through this garden all day. When planting new gardens, look for mostly full sun, and in some spaces, partial sun is okay also. But with our hot Arkansas summers, some shade can be beneficial. At Main Street School, we added more pollinator plants, and we've also trimmed off the dead parts of our old dogwood tree. After many discussions, our group thinks that it may be time to call that old dogwood tree gone and put something new in its place. What to plant? Our group remains undecided but we want to plant a new plant that will be visited by as many species as possible. Rectangular gardens are easy to plan. You can use three inch sticky notes, let them represent three feet square and draw out a plan. We planned a rectangular garden for the Fordyce bathhouse garden. Another rectangular garden is Hesper Hortman's Butterfly Garden near her Soil Conservation Service office on Main Street. It has planter boxes, two two by four feet and two octagons and two four by eight feet waiting to be filled. Hesper planned a butterfly garden for a daycare center. It's been a big hit, lots of interest. It's best to start small and expand if wanted. Always keep in mind the maintenance, the upkeep, and don't overplant. This can lead to neglect because it's too much to maintain. You can always add on if things go well. Pictured here is Hesper's puddling station. Joan Lambert put in a very attractive puddling station at Energy Park. She molded it herself with hypertufa. More on puddling stations later when we discuss the library courtyard. Another example of a rectangular plant boxes is at Lake Hamilton Middle School. This school is uh, mostly for sixth and seventh graders. There, the shop students from Lake Hamilton High School built four four by eight foot boxes. The middle school students, led by Mrs. Strong, obtained grant money for, from Texas A&M professor and to put in a butterfly garden at the school. Students helped to fill the planter boxes with soil and planted the plants and then painted rocks to label each of their new plants. This is obedient plant with cone flowers. Coreopsis, a little pugster butterfly bush, and yarrow. A buckeye on a, the little pugster butterfly bush. Obedient plant in the back box and in the front box, black and blue salvia and ironweed. A sunflower, monarda, and cone flowers. Two types of Menarda or wild bergamot. A fringe, a little small fringe tree and vitex tree. And here's a vitex tree in bloom. The Strong's famous sunflowers. And here are the students. They, they counted the sunflowers, they cooked the sunflowers, ate the sunflowers, and also saved some to plant for next year. Wayne Lynch's drip line saved this garden this summer as the rain kept to, came to an abrupt halt in mid-June and the summer became very dry. You could see where the green of the drip lines were and all the brown of the dead grass. New native gardens need tending and watering until they become established. After planting several new gardens, it looks like this until established time may indeed be the entire first year. 
So until established time varies a lot depending on seasonal weather. A new garden must be closely watched. We offer Fountain Lake School District some of our leftover plants from our butterfly garden at Lake Hamilton, and it just happened that they had a large horseshoe-shaped retaining wall, which was their legacy garden that needed to be revamped. Lynn Janaski, our master gardener with that district, was quick to jump to the offer. She spoke with Carol Mercer, the agriculture teacher, and he requested that we uh, put in some plants in the school colors, which are yellow and purple. So we thought about which were some good plants in these colors. Purple porterweed, black-eyed Susan, yellow blooming jasmine, purple prairie cone flowers, purple ground-hugging lantana, beard's tongue, Mexican hat. They already had purple crepe myrtles, so we began with a pruning demonstration on them. James Moore did a pruning demonstration for the students. Here's a student pruning a crepe myrtle with Ann Hires. We also met with the students and did a craft classroom lesson on native plants and landscape design. Post-it notes layout for squares or rectangles are easy. Kidney bean shapes are highly effective, but sometimes an opportunity comes up like Fountain Lake that we just had to take. And my advice on an already existing garden is to just get started with what's available at the box stores and local nurseries. When presented with an opportunity to plant an existing garden, do your homework. Arm yourself with plant lists and recommended species. Lay it out with taller species at the back or middle. Go shopping with your phone and hope for, I, for Wi-Fi to look things up. Is it native? How big does it get? What are its water requirements? When does it bloom and for how long? Plant size tends to dictate where it needs to be placed. But after many years of gardening, I finally realized that plants can be dug up and moved. It's okay. And sometimes a new location can inspire something quite wonderful. It's too big for the spot. It's not getting enough sun or too much sun. Try moving it. Fitting a pollinator garden into an existing shape is trickier, more involved, but rewarding. This is a picture of, of the students and master gardeners adding soil and compost in the, to the beds. This is our first planting day. This is our picture of our happy senior who's now gone to college to become an agriculture teacher. These are the plants with the legacy blocks. These are plants which are behind their large podium. And this is a view of the garden from the south end. We were asked to plan and plant the Garland County Library Courtyard. On this project, it was requested that we include songbird interest, plus a seed-saving element. Paul, our library guy, suggested a seed-saver area as the library has a seed catalog. When birds became part of the plan, a water feature needed to be water, and moving water also attracts their attention. With water added, we planned a puddling station and mister to keep the sand damp. Hummingbirds like to play in the mist. In planning this garden, I had to enlist help with the plan drawing. I initially made a mistake that was quickly noticed upon the big, first big rain after we installed the rock border. Quick adjustments were made before planting day to correct the drainage that we blocked. Boy, it looked good. It just filled up like a bathtub, as Butch put it. Butch is the new facilities guy at the library and really great to work with. 
So quick adjustments were made just before planting. Many thanks. Puddling stations are areas with wet sand and mud that hold minerals that butterflies and other insects instinctively seek to stay healthy. Sea salt and well-aged manure can be mixed in with the sand and mud to enhance your number of visitors. In the wild, creatures eat rotted fruit and dung and can be observed on muddy roadsides or in barnyards in the muck feeding. Nearby rocks give butterflies a place to sun and dry themselves. After observing this for almost a year, I'd say the wasp and dirt daubers enjoy this area more than any other species. Then we had three work days. First, to clear the grass. Second, to add the soil. And third day, was plant day. Here's Kelsey, our library employee volunteer. The question of the day was, how many master gardeners does it take to get a toad out from under a parked car in the parking lot? The answer, at least 12. Now it's fun to work in the court courtyard. There's always activity, buzzing bees, giant grasshoppers, and the biggest praying mantis I've ever seen. He had his funny head cocked and was staring at me when I got the phone focused on him. Just a little bit creepy. Guess my favorite is the funny squeak of the hummingbirds fussing at you and hoping you're leaving their area. You've interrupted them again. In closing, we hope we have given you some ideas about planting for pollinators. I urge you to get involved in providing homes for lots of species. Observing them enriches our daily lives. Together, we can make a difference, beautify our surroundings, and contribute our little square of the big patchwork quilt. In the words of Doug Tallamy, noted biologist, Imagine if all the back and front yards and even patio container plants across the country were seen as one magnificent patchwork quilt, a homegrown national park. Home gardeners would join forces to bring back a variety of native plants to protect and nurture struggling birds, bees, and other pollinators. Well, I'm all in, Doug Tallamy. I sure hope some of you listening this evening will join us. That was just awesome. Every time I watch it, I start crying. <laughs> but anyway, enough about me. Now, I bet we have some questions, Paul, for our Master Gardener buddies. Uh, we do have a few, and but first of all, um, first of all, Judy, thank you very much for the kind words at the beginning. The, the shout out for uh, my recognition and this in the record, and totally and deserved. Appreciate it, and uh, thank all of you for highlighting the project you had in our courtyard in the library. Um, I love, love those pictures, and you did such wonderful job. And everybody that walks in and views. Um, at the courtyard, like so many people have, have given us um, praise and, and comments on that. We couldn't have done it without you. So appreciate all of you for uh, chronicling that and putting it in the video and and working really hard to make it uh, a, a long term part of the library. And I'd like to say something, you know, Anne was talking in the video about, you know, day three, you know, we're doing this, this and this, but it was months of planning and a lot of work and I am just very impressed by everything that you all have done in the youth program and the pollinator areas. It's just, once again, makes me so proud to be a master gardener. So there we go. Any questions? <clears throat> yes, we do have a few questions. I'm going to give one more call um, for anybody watching live. If you have questions or just want to share a story about your experiences with pollinators, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. And while we're waiting for a few more questions to come in, um, I do want to make an announcement. If you're watching this in the next uh, 
23, 22 hours or so, um, you can, is that showing up on the screen? Yes, it is. Okay, excellent. Program um, that will we'll cover the ballot issues that are going to be on the ballot. Uh, early voting starts Monday, the 24th, and goes all the way through um, until Election Day on November 8th. The library is one of many polling locations in Garland County. If you live in Garland County, you can vote at any polling location, including the library. So um, we, you can come see this uh, presentation in person or watch it uh, live or the recording of it if you want to learn about the four issues on the ballot. And um, it's going to be a presentation by Allison Crane, who I'm sure many of the Master Gardeners know. Uh, she works over at the uh, Extension office um, as part of the, the U, U of A system. And she, she does a great, great work over there and has had many great presentations for us. So thank you, Allison. Um, and uh, hope everybody learns a lot about their ballot issues and, and makes an informed decision before you go and vote. So, and, and shout outs to you, Judy. I know uh, you've done some uh, voter registration and I hope that went smoothly for you. Yes, you it did. Last week. And I'm going to be a poll worker, too. So this is all new stuff. Thanks to Susan Koenig. I have uh, broadened my political uh, uh, no. responsibility. <laughs> so right. anyway, I just thought the video was great. And I also want to say a big thanks to Pam McCoy. Mm -hmm. And also, as I understand, Anne's husband, Mike. <laughs> so thank you, Mike and Pam. All right, so let's move on to these questions. Um, and uh, last call, if you have any, get those in. Uh, one questioner or commenter will get a $25 gift card to the Lake Hamilton Garden Center. And from Joyce on Facebook, she asked, are there any flowers that attract butterflies but not moths? Hmm. <laughs> How dare you ask something we don't know the answer to? <laughs> <laughs> I have found out a lot about moths that I didn't know, but I don't know of a flower that attracts one but not the other. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know either. The moths like the grasses, and that's their host plant, um, the native grasses. Um I found that out. I did not know that. And they also, a lot of moths nest in the leaves. That you, it, That's why we say leave the leaves. And if you ever um, water with your hose, when and not just automatic watering, when you're watering with your hose, you can see little moths run to take cover because they don't like to be too wet. And so, you know, you learn a lot when you water with the hose and just walk, watch what happens in your yard. So that's how I learned a lot about moths. There's a whole group of them that are white. They're really cute. Uh, well, thank you for your your stumper, Joyce. Uh, I'm sure between all the gardening books and the insect books at the library, we probably have about 2,000 of those. And somewhere in one of them, there's an answer. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Joyce followed up with, I'm curious because I have beehives and don't want to attract any moths. Oh. 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 Um, did, did you have a softball, Judy? Well, actually, I, I really um, am interested in what you think is if you if you got to pick maybe two plants to plant in your pollinator garden, what would you all pick? I would okay. pick a butterfly weed so that you would it's a really good um, plant for monarchs. So I would pick that one. What would you pick? Yeah. I would pick probably black and blue sage. It's it's popular. It spreads by itself, and oh, really? uh, after it freezes, you just snip off the tops, and then in the spring, it starts back up. And butterflies all like it, and hummingbirds particularly like it. And you can watch them go down the down the row and check each little flower. It's it's real fun to watch. Do they stay pretty upright? They do stay yes. upright until the freeze. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. About three feet tall and it spreads, so it's a nice plant to have. At our last, um, 
guess it was the last plant sale. I bought a chased tree, a vitex, and it was just a little stick. And now it's huge. Yeah. And really draws so many different things to it. You know, I'm really mm -hmm. astounded by just the simple things you can do in your yard that really do bring the pollinators in. And we really are losing our pollinators. And so it's important that we understand that without pollinators, there are no food supplies. Right. So, um, you know, I think it's wonderful what y'all are doing, what you're teaching the students. I learned something during this process when I just put a few plants out in my sod yard. Uh, when you bring things out of the greenhouse, you have to harden them off so they get used to the new weather. And so I would bring them to my home and put them in the side yard where I could water them. And, and there were just a few things sitting over there in an area that had no activity. And all of a sudden I had butterflies and moths and bees over there just on one or two plants. So it just showed you that one or two things really can draw out some interest of things flying by. And so it's easier than I thought it was to attract pollinators. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, speaking of losing our pollinators, we had another Facebook question or, uh, from Cindy on Facebook. She says, I didn't see many, if any, bees this year. Oh, we've seen we've a lot seen of bees. A lot. <laughs> a lot of bees. Mm -hmm. The thing, um, when we, we planted a fennel plant and it was just like a tiny plant, like that big. And then we just happened to plant it in front of a watering uh, system in front of our watering hose mm -hmm. and it grew like over six feet tall and we had so many pollinators on that we had all different kinds of bees and wasps it was just incredible so it, it, it looked like it was moving the fennel yeah. was just covered with things and it looked like it was moving it, yeah it had lots of bee activity so and the, the early clovers are really good for bees yeah and that's when the bees start looking for something there's not much blooming yet, but the clovers in your yard, if you just don't cut them, uh, let them go until there's other things blooming, that's a big help for bees in your yard. What I found is I planted some basil in my vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. That thing has been alive. I mean, I, I, I picked enough basil for any kind of thing I ever wanted to cook and just let it go to blossom, and they are <laughs> still on it. Yeah, basil. Yeah, only thing that survived the frost last night. Yeah, yeah, that thirty degrees kind of got us, didn't it? A month early. Oh well. Yeah. Uh, I see we've had a handful of viewers join in late. Um, if you um, are just tuning in, this video, the recording, will be available to watch uh, afterwards on Facebook or YouTube. So you can go back and watch the beginning. And if you're just tuning in, we are here in just a couple minutes going to raffle away a free or a $25 gift card to Lake Hamilton Garden Center. Uh, so if you, all you have to do to enter is ask a question or leave a comment. And we have a question on YouTube from Susan who says, I had some monarchs on my porter weed just last week. Is that unusual since it's not their host plant? And Anne and Mary, uh, I'll repeat that. Uh, I saw the light went off on you. Uh, it should be motion based. In, there you go. There there you go. go. Uh, so Susan's question was, I had some monarchs on my porter weed just last week. Is that unusual since it's not their host plant? Uh, porter weed's a wonderful nectar plant for all uh, bees, butterflies, moths, hummingbirds love the that out in the library courtyard, the hummingbirds fuss at me for being in their way because porterweed's their favorite thing out there. So and, it's a wonderful nectar plant. And it's not unusual at this time of the year still because like about two weeks ago at one of our school gardens at Main Street School, we had um, monarchs there too. And mm -hmm. also like a what was it like three weeks ago? Mm -hmm. We were even saw like monarch caterpillars and um, and chrysalises at Lake Hamilton School. So there's still a lot of monarchs yeah. around. Late September is when we saw monarchs this year. Yeah, I think the times vary a bit by yeah. several weeks. 
of when they're coming through and going back south and whatnot. Yeah. But people kept saying, have you seen them yet? Have you seen them yet? And we were like, no. But then when we did, it was seemed a little late, but we saw a quite lot. a few. One of the Lake Hamilton students, big guy, bigger than Mary and I, said, I don't think I've ever seen a caterpillar before. And he just stood there he staring at it. it. It was pretty neat. They were hooked onto the school and in the windows. And then there's a big milkweed in the garden. And, and there were several caterpillars and, and uh, chrysalises on there. And the kids were pretty fast. They were excited. It. They were excited. It was fun. It was awesome. That's awesome. That's what we need for the next generation to get behind this movement. And yeah, yeah, it was awesome. A little bit of saving the world, y'all. <laughs> now, I, I would like to um, show the to, a couple things, Paul. The resource list, yes, that that Anne and Mary put together for us, and um, also we have um, the plant list at the library so these are wonderful resources and these two uh, plant lists are at the library for you to pick up and then we're always open for questions and you can get a hold of us through the extension agent and uh, agency and like I said, it's at 236 Woodbine or just give them a call. If you've got any questions for Ann or Mary, we'll be happy to pass those along. And one other thing I'd like to show again is the QR code, which we're really proud about, obviously, that you can access to um, apply to be a master gardener. And it, it sounds like, you know, apply to be a master gardener is a big thing. We just want your information if you're interested in it we'll we'll contact you we'll get you with the mentor and ann and mary are have both been mentors i was a mentor but i'm not a very good mentor so <laughs> i'm not good anymore but um you know it it they kind of take you through the steps show you the projects that they work on and the project that everybody else works on and it really is a unbelievable group of people with so much knowledge that you can learn from and uh, so, like I said, I encourage everybody, if you want to be a master gardener, shine your light, uh, your phone light on that camera, on that QR code and and sign up. I think you'll get a lot out of it. And if nothing else, you'll learn how to plant a wonderful pollinator garden in your home yard. So that's all I've got, Paul. Mary, Ann, anything else? No. No. Thank you. It was a wonderful, wonderful video and a wonderful program and a lot of hard work. And I sure do appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Absolutely. And we have a winner. Uh, Yay. And our winner uh, is from YouTube, Susan K. Congratulations. Awesome. Just uh, come to the front desk at the library and uh, let them know you want a gift card and we'll grab it for you and have you sign for it. So that is awesome. I bet we know that Susan K. I think we do. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Oh, All right. Susan says uh, your presentation was delightful. Thank yes, you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Judy, do we have a topic to reveal for November? Oh yes, it is the uh, holiday tablescapes. Uh, Marianne Jarvis is going to be doing some tablescapes for uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And she'll also have some help from Teresa Withers making wreaths and just using a lot of things from nature. Uh, so I think it'll be really fun to watch and they're really, really creative. Um, Dee uh, Offen Offerman and Marianne have done these things in the past and it's surprising what they can make out of just a stick. Uh, you know, it's just, I I'm not that crafty, but join us next month for uh, some really great, uh, fun holiday crafting, I guess. Excellent. Third Wednesday of the month at six o'clock, Paul and I will be here. So we hope you all are too. And that'll be the 16th. Yep, the 16th. All right, well, thank you, all of you, the Master Gardeners. Uh, love our relationship the at the library with the Master Gardeners and all you do for us, all this great programming, the courtyard and so many other things you do for the library and the community and our patrons. And uh, hope everybody has a great evening. And if you tuned in late or you want to share this program, 
you can watch it in its entirety from the beginning on Facebook or YouTube, as well as the, what is it, almost 20 now programs we've done that are recorded. 24. <laughs> 24, wow, so two dozen. All right. So the, all those are available um, all, on the library's playlist uh, on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, you'll be able to go back, scroll back there in order from most recent to oldest. So there's a lot of great topics there. Yeah. Yep. I, and lots more. I won't and, ask you to pick a favorite, Judy. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know. I'm Too many. Uh, my relationship started with just being really scared about, you know, getting on the virtual uh, situation. And then it is... Um, it has broadened my horizons because I've gotten to talk to so many different people, meet so many different people, and the library has just given me that opportunity. And the Master Gardeners, once again, appreciate the library as well. And the library is embarking on a new journey with a community garden that is going to be so cool. I cannot wait. What, what Anne and Mary have done with the courtyard is going to explode. And... Mm -hmm. It is. And yeah. Adam and Kelsey, it just. I just thought of an idea that I'll say live on on the broadcast here. I uh, mentioned our facilities manager, Butch, earlier, and I don't know if he's willing, but uh, we should try and get him as a guest whenever that the courtyard is ready to go. Oh, yeah. I think that would be great because it's going to be awesome, y'all. So we are, we are so fortunate to have a library that is so progressive. Mm -hmm. and so into the community because not many people have it. I yeah. was talking to my sister today and she's like, man, our library is absolutely awesome. And I'm like, yes, it is. So very good. Have a lovely evening. Happy Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Happy Halloween. We'll see you before Thanksgiving and show you how to build a beautiful tablescape. Neat. All right, have a good one, everyone.